Okay. Hey guys, so for a tin whistle, let me just start with a few basics before we get into the first lesson. And that is, um, just don't, don't stress over this too much. Um, we're not aiming for uh, perfect musicians. Our goal here is to introduce the vocabulary, um, expose them to a musical instrument, and um, just get them to learn more about music. Um, so if you have any that really aren't um, getting the notes and, and the music, it's perfectly fine. Just do your best to drill the vocabulary and expose them to everything that CC wants you to do. Um, the second thing is that you really want to follow the lesson plan in your foundations guide. They have everything that you need step by step. I do the same as well. Even all my years of, of musical experience in band, um, I still stick to what they do. That just helps me under, my musical experience helps me understand this better, but really I stick to their lesson plan and what they do. Um, and then over the next few weeks when things get a little harder, I can share some really good ideas with you to help drill this into them. But um, week one is just so, um, week seven, I'm sorry, the first week of Tin Whistle is so easy. It's very, very easy. You're just introducing it. Um, and just try not to cut corners on on this trust the trust the program um trust cc uh this is a really good lesson plan we're really introducing a lot like pieces at a time we just keep adding on to it so it's really really good um i've seen a lot of ideas over the years that just stray a little too far we're just going a little, a little too far with it and we're not keeping it classical anymore um so just keep it classical trust cc and um i know last year and i think the year before that we had, uh, there, were, uh, there were many tutors, many videos saying to color code or label the notes. And um, the reason that's not a good idea is that we're doing the work for them and then they end up just matching things up when really we really want them to learn this, learn the notes, um, get that muscle memory going. If you do have really tiny kids in your class and they're struggling to find those um, finger holes because you know a tin whistle looks like this and it can be hard for them to find those finger holes so if you have a little class and you want to help them out you could put these white circles over the finger holes um, if they're really struggling or just leave it leave it completely blank if you would like um, and so probably the third thing would be to be sure to lay out your expectations from the very beginning um, and by that I mean this instrument is very fun they want to blow into it some of them want to drum with it and, and tap tap their neighbor with it so just have it in your mind what you want them to be doing with that tin whistle um, whether they have it you know they lay it in the table in front of them and they don't touch it or some tutors like them to have both hands on it in their lap um, it's it's up to you, it's classroom management, whatever you think is best for your class to be able to do that, but just at least lay out the expectation of, guys, you cannot be picking it up, playing with it, blowing in it. If you do, this is what will happen. So it's really it's really good to have that laid out. Um, okay, so getting into week seven, very easy. This is the, the easiest week um, we're just introducing. So go ahead and turn to your foundations guide. Um, Sorry. Page 167, it just lays out kind of table of contents of what we're going to be doing the next um, six weeks. So go ahead and turn to page 158. It should look just like this. This is the first part. Um, this lesson is three pages. I'm going to go through it with you. But please, I am just summarizing this. I'm trying to hit the, import in the important parts. Um, but read every single word. I'm not going to sit here and read every single word to you. So you need to do that read through your lesson plan. So week seven, you can see every time when we start a week right here at the top, they're going to have your grammar and vocabulary that you, you drill. Okay. Then once you get through the vocabulary then you go into theory and tin muscle practice. So vocabulary, um, this week you can go ahead and, and read through that. Then it wants you to get straight into practice. Um, I wouldn't necessarily read the vocabulary in a list to them if you have really little ones. If you have older ones and you want to tell them this is the vocabulary for the day, you can do that. Um, I don't necessarily do that. I just, I just use that as a note for myself. This is the vocabulary we're covering this week. 
and then I just start right at um, practice. So what they want you to do is introduce the students to the 10 whistle. You will see that the words in bold are the vocabulary for that week, and that's what you really want to hit home with them. You want to make sure they're paying attention to those vocabulary words. So introduce that as the 10 whistle. Um, it's a new tool called an instrument, and it makes its own unique sound. So have them, you know, tell them they can pick it up. Maybe they can feel it, you know, whatever they want to do. And then what you're going to have them do is play, you know, blow into it and they'll, you know, some of them will go crazy with it, and um, you can have them do this a couple of times, maybe 10 seconds at a time, you know, have them play it and then stop and play it and stop, and then um, that will introduce to them the, uh, the next vocabulary word, which is cacophony, how it just sounds so awful, it's not harmonized, and um, then we, so it says number two, like I said before, it's not the standard that no one is to play or doodle while you're teaching. So number three, we want to identify the parts of the tin whistle. Um, this is this is very important to get to know the instrument that you are playing. So have them pick it up, look at it, and then you can go through and identify each of the parts, which are also vocabulary words this week. And they do have it drawn out for you right here. So look at that and study um, the different parts of the instrument so that you can just read that off to them. That's very important with tin whistle is to kind of know the lesson before you get in there. You can have this with you, bring your foundations guide to set beside of you if you get lost where you're at, you know, and you want to make sure you, you do each thing, that's great. But you don't want to just hold it in front of you and just read straight through it. You want to be able to know know the lesson. So number three just goes on to um, covering more vocabulary about the different parts of the tin whistle. So go ahead and turn to page 159, number four. This is where we show students how to properly hold the tin whistle. So basically, read through this paragraph. It's basically going to show you this. This is what I tell my class, that they want to sit up straight. We want to get this airflow going, and we want to look professional. We're playing a musical instrument. It makes them feel a little special. So we want to sit up nice and straight and hold their tin whistle at a 45-degree angle. So show them. Let them, you know, they can demonstrate it themselves, or you can do it for them. We're not going to be holding it like this with our elbows on the table or holding it up high or, or down here low like this. To get the best sound from your note, we want to sit up straight and hold it at a 45 degree angle. Um, and then, of course, your left hand will go on top. Your right hand will go on the bottom. Um, a little tip before I get into the left hand, right hand thing is don't try to just cover the uh, finger hole with just the tip of your finger. Instead, lay the pad of your finger over the hole. A lot of people try to play it just like this. They think that they're, they're, the tips of their fingers have to go into the finger hole. Not only is this more difficult, but air can still escape sometimes, especially with those little tiny fingers. So teach them, and this is for yourself too, you just need to lay the pad of your finger over the hole. That's all you have to do. You don't have to get the very tip in there. So, um, anyways, so uh, left hand on top, right hand on the bottom. A lot of people ask me, you know, is this important? What if they want to switch it? I would recommend not switching it um, because we're going to go on to do left hand exercises, right hand exercise, that instrument muscle memory. We all need to be learning how to play it correctly. Um, you know, in all of my years of music playing different instruments, we had people that were left-handed, people that were right-handed, and we all still held and used the instruments one way. But obviously, if you have a kid in your class that's really struggling and they do not want to do it that way, I mean, I, <laughs> you got to do what you got to do if they really have to switch it. But um, I do recommend keeping left hand on top, right hand on bottom, no matter if you're left-handed or right-handed. That's just how you hold the instrument. So, um, so just read through that paragraph on number four on how to properly hold your tin whistle. Get familiar with that. Try it yourself and demonstrate that to the students. Then number five, we're moving on to the uh, tin whistle scale. So this is our tin whistle scale. You can hold that up and show it to them. And then I think on number five, yeah, it just wants you to... Um, explain no I'm sorry that's number six number five we're talking more about how to blow steadily into it they want you to play a note B so that'll be just the first finger 
Um, also, I have a lot of students say, you know, when we have all of our fingers on it, that's fine. They can hold it very well, but they sometimes don't know what to do when our right hand isn't on it, or maybe only one is, or even when you play a C and there's there's no finger holes um, covered. Sometimes they, they ask, well, what do we what do we do with what do we do with that? How do we hold it? I just recommend using. Obviously, you have both of your thumbs here on the back to help support it. You can even use um, a pinky to maybe help support it. But you also have your mouth when you're playing. It can kind of rest in your mouth, in between your lips. So, um, so number five, they want you to play using the D scale chart. Play uh, the B note together. Um, and then it talks about how you want to blow it gently and steadily. You don't want to just like blow really hard. What I do in my classes, I um, I let them do that at first. You know, I say like, it's it's not going to sound, it's going to sound very shrill and too high pitched. The note's not going to sound right. If you blow really hard, give it a try. And I have them try it. And then I have them blow like not enough air so that they understand that that's going to um, mess up the sound of that note by blowing too hard or not hard enough. And then, then I have them practice blowing steadily gently and getting that note just right. And then number six is to explain um, the notes and the note names and all of that using your D scale. So make sure you look at number six in the vocabulary along with that for the D scale. Now we can go into music theory. So turn your page to 160. So um, tell the students that they will be learning to read and write a little bit of music. It's like reading and writing a sentence. So you're going to show the students too much of a little star or Mary Had a Little Lamb. So um, if you turn further in your foundations guide, you will have, I think it's page 178 and 179, you will have these. You want to identify the staff, these five lines going right here. Identify that. Um, I also use my big uh, board to draw the staff on there. They need to be seen how that's drawn because later they're going to have to draw it themselves. I know that um, it might be easier to have um, on our 10 whistle packet the staff already on there. And there are a few parts where the staff is already printed on there for um, time reasons. But a lot of times you'll see that they have to draw it themselves. It's just you know very classical for them to be able to draw it and create it themselves so that by the time we're done with this, they can write their own music. So, um, so identify the staff, and um, that's number three. Number four, talk about how we use, you know, as we use ABCs in, in writing words, we have ABCs in music to have notes as well. And then number five, they want you to use this to show um, how the melody moves up and down. Um, so, or how fast or how slow. And then number six, compare the cacophony earlier to the sound of an orchestra. So you can even have them go back and do a cacophony again, have them blow through it, you know, all they want. Let them get their, get their fun out and, and see that it does not sound good together. And then you could either ask them to think about music that they've heard before, like a beautiful piece of music and how it's very harmonized, or you could even have them practice that B note again, you know, where we're just we're playing it just like this, have them play it all together, and that sounds much better and harmonized um, than the cacophony that they played earlier. So that's pretty much it for week seven. Like I said, it is so easy. We're just getting in into it, introducing it. So then what you'll want to do is go to your 10 whistle packet. If you look through this, you'll see that for each week I just made one sheet. Um, I just wrote out one sheet to go with that week. So you're not going to have to worry about flipping back and forth or, you know, doing too many sheets that day. We're just going to do one sheet to kind of drill in what we talked about that day. And so for week seven, um, what I chose for them to do is draw a picture of your tin whistle. If your kids are really, really tiny and you know that they're going to have no idea how to draw it, maybe you could help them on your board um, or just see how it goes. <laughs> let them Let them draw it. And then when they're done, at the bottom it says label the tin whistle part. So for the little tiny ones that can't write at all, maybe just have them draw a line to it. You say the first one's mouthpiece. Everybody draw a line to the mouthpiece. Um, but for the older ones, they'll be able to write it and label it if they would like because it's all spelled right here. And that's pretty much it, guys. Week 7 is super simple. Um, as we get up in the weeks, week 8, not too bad. 
Um, but then I think around week nine is when it gets a little more difficult where people are not really understanding um, what the book is talking about. And you'll also notice, too, when we get through each week, week eight, week nine, we are reviewing everything that we have learned so far. We're just adding it all together. And you'll be amazed what they pick up by the sixth week. So if you guys have any questions, please let me know. But um, week seven is very, very easy. And then I will start on my videos later for the following weeks. So let me know if you have any questions on that.